for three years. We are uh, a 19 bed glasses hospital with uh, acute and swing patients. The majority of our patients are, are swing patients. Um, our average daily census for acute patients is less than two. Uh, we have a full service emergency department, 24-7. Um, diagnostic imaging uh, services, including x-ray, ultrasound, CT, and bone density. Uh, we have a laboratory uh, on, on site that does the majority of our laboratory work, but we do send more complicated lab tests to uh, reference laboratories outside of Grace Cottage. Uh, we also have a very busy um, and very well uh, utilized uh, rehabilitation program at Grace Cottage that provides PT and OT services both inpatient and outpatient. Uh, we are a licensed rural health clinic uh, that's extremely well staffed with primary care providers. We have six primary care MDs. We have one full-time pediatrician. We have four advanced practice providers, the APPs, that work in our health clinic. We have a psychiatric and nurse practitioner, and we have a uh, full-time licensed social worker in the health clinic. We also have a, a very well staffed, very talented community health team that consists of an art and care coordinator, uh, a nurse outreach coordinator, a diabetes educator, a behavioral health specialist, uh, a health coach, and also a patient resource advocate. Uh, in addition to the hospital, uh, we also have an on campus, not attached to the hospital, but on campus. A retail pharmacy called Messenger Valley Pharmacy, which is an extremely well-utilized service that's uh, of tremendous benefit to uh, the local community uh, relative to their pharmaceutical needs. Uh, Grace Cottage is very proud of its reputation and its culture of being a highly uh, patient-focused customer service organization. Uh, Two years in a row, we received the award from the National Rural Health Association uh, as a top 20 critical access hospital for patient satisfaction uh, in the country. We're very proud of that uh, two years in a row. Uh, most recently in the, the local uh, Wyndham County Best of um, poll, uh, we, won, we won these uh, five awards. Um, Best Hospital in Wyndham County, Best Emergency Department. Uh, second year, we were awarded the best place to work in Wyndham County. We have a very, very uh, uh, highly satisfied uh, uh, staff at Grace Cottage. We also won uh, second year in a row best physical therapy uh, in Wyndham County, and this year uh, best uh, pediatrician in Wyndham County. So, um, very pleased with the results of the local. Uh, community survey about uh, Grace Cottage and the services we provide. This slide is just a, a reminder. Um, when you look at, uh, when Stephen presents the financials for, for Grace Cottage, he talks about um, our um, increase in that patient service revenue that's being forecasted uh, for next year. Uh, I think it's I think it's you know, pertinent to recognize that uh, of the total uh, net patient service revenue in the entire state of Vermont's health system, uh, Grace Cottage uh, constitutes uh, less than one percent of that total net patient service revenue. So, um, you know, we we have a very very minuscule impact on on overall uh, uh, revenue uh, as a percentage of total in the state of Vermont. Um, so we just wanted to, to point that out as a reminder uh, because you will see uh, forecast an increase in that patient service revenue for next year that's based on, on volume uh, projections. So what are some of the issues that Grace Cottage is uh, contending with um, going into next year? Well, clearly you want to continue to increase uh, access to primary care. The primary care is what Grace Cottage uh, does really well. It's uh, the, the foundation of what we do as a healthcare organization. And we truly believe that by providing access to uh, everyone who needs uh, a relationship with a primary care provider, 
we are doing everything we possibly can to improve the health of our communities, the health of our patients, which subsequently uh, we believe reduces the cost of health care. Because if you take care of people and you keep them managing their care well, um, they tend to stay out of emergency departments and hopefully they um, uh, don't end up in, in high cost uh, acute care settings like uh, operating rooms and cancer centers and other types of, uh, of high cost services. So we really believe in managing uh, the health and well-being of our patients and our community and by doing that through our primary care uh, services and having access for additional patients uh, when they need primary care, we're really contributing to, to health and wellness. Uh, we're also looking to expand our access to rehab services. You know, we have, we have a very highly skilled team of rehabilitation providers uh, who do an excellent job of getting patients back home and out of the facility uh, where they belong, where they need to be. And, you know, we, we see that as a center of excellence for us. And so we want to make sure we're available and uh, we're treating as many patients who can benefit from the skill and expertise of those providers that work in our rehabilitation program. Um, so it's really about, about uh, expanding access to services and reducing the cost of care. Um, that's really germane to our, our positive uh, opportunities going forward. Uh, some of the challenges and issues we, we deal with, um, you know, I mean, CHT, for example, community health team is is a very, very valuable service to our community, um, but it's also not well funded, and so it is a an expense uh, anchor for Grace Cottage. But we truly believe that it's a it's a program, it's a group of provider uh, clinicians who uh, really uh, complement the work we're doing in primary care, and also complement our efforts to improve the health of our communities. And so. Uh, by having CHT available to our patients, we, we really um, offer a complimentary uh, cadre of, of services that help our primary care providers and caregivers to maximize the impact they can have on our patients. Primary care recruitment and retention, I'm sure you've heard that from other hospitals uh, during the, the last week or so. Uh, primary care recruitment is always a challenge, uh, particularly given the fact that there aren't enough providers uh, nationwide to meet all of the demand for primary care. And so when we have a vacancy at Grace Cottage, um, you know, recruiting to fill that position is always something of a, of a challenge. Uh, however, we, we've been quite, uh, quite successful in uh, bringing primary care providers to Grace Cottage, and, and we truly believe that uh, the reason for our success is because of the model uh, of care and the way we deliver it, and also the culture of uh, support and respect for our employees and the work that they do, and making sure that all of our employees, whether they're providers, cl clinical providers or not, have the resources and the, the tools they need to do their jobs successfully and do, and do their jobs well. Uh, not to mention that Southern Vermont is a beautiful place to, to work and, and live, and, and so uh, we believe that, that that helps us recruit as well. But we are an employer of choice with very, very low turnover uh, relative to other organizations that we benchmark against, and I think that reputation you know, is, is something that benefits us when it comes to recruitment. Uh, nursing staff recruitment is also a challenge because nursing uh, is one of the largest uh, employee programs at Grace Cottage, uh, but I'm, I'm actually quite um, pleased uh, when I look at, again, the turnover rate uh, within nursing at Grace Cottage is, is exceptionally low, and I'm also pleased when I look at um, the money we spend to, to staff our, our nursing program and how much money we have to spend on, on agency or local tenants, uh, nurses, it's extremely low uh, compared to other hospitals and compared to benchmarks. And so I think that's a testament, again, to uh, employee satisfaction and the uh, desire for nurses to want to work at Grace Cottage. Uh, oftentimes, when we have a vacant position, uh, we can interview multiple candidates and can pick the best one. And we also um, have the, the, the ability to, uh, to pass on, on nursing candidates that we don't feel are a good fit for Grace Cottage. So, 
something that the hospitals don't have the benefit of being able to do. So, um, I will uh, pass the mic over to uh, Stephen and he'll uh, pick up with this next slide. Just want to do, we've brought this a couple of different years in the past. I don't think we actually brought this slide last year, but just to remind or reiterate or point out what truly is the biggest risk, in my opinion, for Grace Cottage's survival and the basically <coughs> the barrier to us having a positive bottom line is the continued increase in the amount of money that essentially Grace Cottage's supporting the state of Vermont, um, covering shortfalls from the Vermont Medicaid program. This slide, which is information you have, it's directly off from the Schedule H that was submitted in 2018, um, 994. Our gross Medicaid charges in 2018 were just under $4 million. The actual cost to Grace Cottage to provide those services was about $2.7 million. Medicaid actually paid us only just under $1.4 million for those. So they're only paying us 50% of what actually even costs us to take care of those patients, much less the ability to even make a dollar. We're actually losing that money. We're losing $1.3 million taking care of Medicaid patients. In addition to that, we write them a check for $620,000 for Medicaid tax, which we have no benefit from, being that we are not eligible for disproportionate share payments. So, you know, on a s facility with a budget our size, to basically be writing a check for $2 million to the state of Vermont is a very large hit to our bottom line. I mean, you know, it's a good 10% of our total operating costs is taking care of Medicaid patients. Um, begs the question, should we bother taking care of Medicaid patients? Um, unfortunately, as a, or not, unfortunately, but as a hospital, that's one of our duties is to take care of anybody that needs it. But, you know, it's a very difficult decision to make, to continue to be part of a Medicaid program in the state of Vermont. Um, then just pointing out some of the main indicators for Grace Cottage's um, financial health. These numbers are all directly off the reports that were provided. Giving the last few years of actual history, the current year budget, current year projection, and the coming year budget, um, no dramatic changes up or down in any of the numbers. You'll see pretty consistent year to year over the last couple or three years. With the exception of the top one, which is almost flat, or the budgeted number will be almost flat to our 2018 actual. Most of the rest of them are slightly improved over 2018 actual um, days payable although high at the end of 2019, and that was one of the written responses we provided. It's essentially timing of cost report settlements. Um, but what we're budgeting is improved days payable, improved days receivable, um, although still negative, an improved operating margin over where we ended up in 2018 and where we're projecting to end up in 2019, and an overall total margin percentage, um, though down from 2018, considerably improved over 2019 projection. Next slide. You all have in front of you the income statement and the balance sheet, which are the next two slides, so I won't spend a whole lot of time um, looking at them. Just wanted to point out a couple of high-level items. Um, this particular slide doesn't show the breakdown of gross patient revenue, so I'll wait and talk about that later when we talk about how our current projections um, are versus what we had originally submitted and where some of the increase in net patient service revenue is coming from in the volume growth. This slide, though, does, however, show that 
we are making progress in reducing bad debt write-off. You'll see from on what we're projecting as significantly more business for both 2019 and 2020 versus the 2018 actual year, our bad debt write-off is significantly down um, due to probably several things. Better collections is one, but as Mount Scutney pointed out, we also have a full-time um, patient resource advocate they're doing signing people up for health insurance that was on the community health team we had the one we had was actually a 0.8 FTE and when she left earlier this spring we actually replaced her with a full-time person um, it's very beneficial to getting people covered whether it be for health exchange coverage or Medicaid coverage also helpful in for those that don't qualify getting those people that are willing to fill out a reduced fee application to fill them out um, which is part of the reason why you'll see that our free care has been creeping up over the past two or three years that are on here um, and, and uh, we've always i've said this before here part of the issue is getting people to fill out reduced fee applications there are a lot of our employee our patients i know that would be eligible if they would fill them out or willing to share their information, but they're not, and then they choose to not pay their bills, so eventually it gets written off as a bad debt. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, the middle line here, since we were talking about um, PBMs earlier, or you were talking about PBMs earlier with not got any, the other operating revenue line, you'll see a relatively large decrease in that um, from the past two or three years. That's almost entirely a result of our retail pharmacy. The net proceeds of the retail pharmacy end up in that line. And the current horrendous trend in PBM reimbursements for prescriptions for commercial payers is going down so dramatically that our retail pharmacy with really no other change in operations or volumes over the past three years has gone from being just slightly over break even to probably ending this year at about a $300,000 operating loss. Simply due to decreased reimbursements for drugs that we really have no control over to the point where we have, we fill a lot of prescriptions for our community where the money coming from the PBM isn't even enough to cover what we're paying for that drug, much less something for dispensing it. Um, the other point on here was other operating expenses down near the bottom. You know, we're really working hard to control those operating expenses that we have some control over. Um, salary and benefits are clearly our biggest expense. No control over healthcare provider tax. But other operating expenses, we're doing a really good job of keeping flat or decreasing. You'll see that what we budgeted for 2020 on that line is actually less than where we ended in 2018 and negligibly different from where we're expecting to end in 2019. Nothing real significant to point out on the balance sheet. Um, the benchmarks were already on the previous page. You know, you'll see that the balance sheet, despite having operating losses, is continuing in the a relatively positive projection. Our 2020 budget is still is an increase in fund balance over 2018 actuals. Um, so we're working any way we can to increase our overall financial health. This slide talks uh, about expense drivers and, and cost containment. So um, I think Stephen alluded to the fact that our largest expense driver, uh, approximately 57% of our total expense, is in salaries and benefits. Um, and we work, I'm sorry? Salaries alone. Salary alone, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we work really hard to, to make sure that we uh, have the, a high quality uh, employee team to take care of our patients. Um, and uh, whenever possible, whenever a position becomes vacant at Grace Cottage, uh, we, we take a really critical look at that position to, 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 to determine whether or not 
it's a position that needs to be replaced, and if so, does it need to be replaced the way it was previously staffed, i.e., can a full-time position um, be uh, changed to a per diem position or pretend, potentially two part-time positions to give us more flexibility and ability to adjust um, our cost per, per unit around volumes and, uh, and acuity. Um, the benefits of the second largest uh, expense driver at approximately 19% of our total expense. Um, and we review our benefits uh, routinely and regularly to make sure that we're competitive in the market and that we can adequately recruit and retain staff uh, at the most cost effective means possible. Agency staff uh, is a large expense as a percentage of total expense for Grace Cottage and definitely varies from year to year and, uh, and based on experience in terms of uh, what types of positions uh, turn over at Grace Cottage. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, nursing uh, has been extremely uh, well staffed uh, this past year. Uh, based on our calculation, uh, less than a full-time FT uh, over the course of the entire year in uh, agency uh, or local uh, expense for, for nursing. Uh, so very, very small uh, turnover there. Uh, we have a full-time uh, contract employee uh, in diagnostic imaging for the year, and we had uh, about three months of a contracted employee in the lab for, for the year. Uh, so uh, if you look at this and you compare you know, the cost of staffing at Grace Cottage compared to other um, organizations in the state, um, I think we're, we're in a very, very positive position and hope to to keep ourselves in that in that position going forward uh, and managing our, our labor costs and benefit costs as, uh, as tightly and as efficiently as we possibly can, can manage those expenses. And to address, address the question of how our projection, current projection is compared with the projection we submitted with the budget are the three blue columns here over toward the right. The 2019 budget is the first one. That's what we actually approved for the current year. The middle blue column is what was submitted for a 2019 budget back on July 1st when we submitted the budget. And the right hand column is the most current projection that was submitted in June with the nine month submission. And as you can see, actually, our projection improved just slightly over what was submitted with the budget from a net operating, uh, a net overall loss of 219 to a positive number of 148, with this about a $265,000 um, or $200,000 decrease in net operating income loss. So we are making some strides in this. Um, while I'm here, we'll talk a little bit to answer the question of our overall net patient revenue increase. And it is not at all related really to charge increases. It is strictly related to volume. And on this slide, you can see a little better because this one breaks it down, what areas are increasing. Um, as I pointed out in the written responses, we did not are not including any new services for the coming year over what we're currently doing. The biggest increase is in volume for primary care providers based on the needs in our community and the number of patients that we have coming through our doors of late. Um, we have two new advanced practice professionals starting next month um, to replace some decrease in MD hours. So the biggest increase you'll see on there from the 2019 both budget and projection is a large increase in physician revenue is just strictly increased primary care volume. Directly correlated to that is the fact that the majority of our outpatient revenue is directly proportional to the primary care visits, people needing lab, x-ray, patient rehab services. So there's a corresponding increase in outpatient revenue as well. 
There's also a minor increase in swing bed revenue based on the volume of patients we have seen coming into our swing bed program in the past few months of the fiscal year. Um, it's, none of it is acute. You'll in fact see that the acute budget is actually flat other than the minor 3.2% rate increase. No huge capital budget plans for the coming year. There are no approved or planned CON projects. A few of the larger items included in our fiscal year 2020 capital plans are a new CT unit. Ours is at essentially approaching end of life, um, even though it's not very old. Uh, nurse call system upgrade, some new patient beds, a lab analyzer, continued hospital security surveillance equipment, um, installations primarily, not so much upgrades, but installation. And of course, there's always IT equipment to buy. Just a couple of uh, additional points. Um, we are currently in uh, active discussions with um, the ACO. Uh, regarding our decision to join or not join. Um, we've been evaluating that position and, and uh, you know, monitoring the information that is available to us from uh, One Care Vermont. Um, and like other hospitals that I'm sure have testified during these proceedings, um, we are uh, extremely wary about you know, downside risk uh, of being in, in an ACO given the size of our organization, uh, our ability to weather a uh, significant risk uh, is um, relatively low. And so um, that's something that we're, we're talking with uh, ECO leadership about. Um, we are um, very unique in that we're the only facility in, in the state that doesn't uh, do elective procedures at, at uh, our organization. We don't do surgery. Uh, we don't do uh, anything uh, procedurally that's elected, so we don't have uh, the same levers relative to uh, other hospitals' abilities to to manage and control uh, cost uh, of, of uh, services and number of services that are provided. Uh, we take care of every patient who calls and says, we need an appointment, uh, I need an appointment to see a provider primary care provider, and we don't turn anyone away. Uh, and so, you know, our objective and our mission is to uh, be available and to respond to demand as demand uh, changes. And uh, as far as Grace Cottage is concerned, demand for primary care is, is increasing. Um, so part of the discussion we're having with the ACO is, uh, is, is whether or not Grace Cottage uh, should be treated like a full service community hospital uh, if we were joining uh, as a, uh, a formal member of the ACO, and that's something we were exploring with them, and they're very interested in talking with us about. Um, we continue to work on controlling uh, our costs and reducing our costs uh, and doing what we do best, uh, which is providing high quality primary care, inpatient care, skilled care, and outpatient care. We believe that the budget we submitted um, is uh, conservative. As Stephen said, it's based on, uh, on forecasted uh, change in volume and uh, demand for services. Uh, we believe the operating costs in the budget are, uh, are prudent, uh, they're, they're low, uh, and they're only necessary uh, to take care of the patients that we're forecasting to see next year. And so, um, we're hoping that um, that you'll agree with us and that you'll uh, uh, approve the budget as we've submitted and as we've requested. And uh, we'd be happy to, to take any questions and respond Thank to you, any Doug. concerns. Robin? Sure. I only have a few points. Um, first of all, thank you for the I think the biggest issue in your budget is the forecast around the volume, and I think other people's questions will be more 
uh, appropriate on that topic. So uh, my first comment is really just that uh, I find your comments about Medicaid to be a little bit disturbing, to be frank. Um, two, over two decades ago, Congress made the quid pro quo between DISH and provider tax illegal, so it, that's really not an appropriate way to look at it. Um, I'm Agreed. not going to say anything else, but Agreed. you know, I certainly understand that Medicaid is not the best payer. It's very tough when you have mostly Medicaid and Medicare uh, patients, but um, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, a clarification on the ACO. Um, I think you're looking at Medicaid only risk. Am I remembering? I mean, Medicaid only program. Is that? Am I remembering that right? Most likely, it would only be the Medicaid program at this point. Yeah. And have you been talking to some other hospitals about their experience there? I know you are very different. So we talk a lot, um, particularly on our regular CFO calls, and talk to them individually. And you know, I mean, it's our biggest concern, as you can see from our limited ability to absorb any further losses in our bottom line, is the potential of downside risk. Yeah, um, certainly yeah. understand right. that. Well, I think it's great that you're talking uh, with the ACO and exploring uh, perhaps some creative options right. for treating you a, a little bit differently. We're open to the idea of participating. We certainly don't disagree with it. It's just the ability to be able to absorb that potential loss. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. Tom. Well, it's good to see you again. Um, I have a couple of, of uh, questions just in terms of you answered the one I had about bad debt as to why that was uh, trending favorably. Um, and it sounds like you uh, you know, assigned more of your resources uh, to that. Um, in fringe benefits, just a question, um, a fairly big increase in uh, the uh, fringe benefits for non-MDs, non uh, 2020 over 2019 at 19%, um, which is a big number for you folks, $676,000. And I'm just wondering if most of that has to do with the 20 hour per week. Um, that was a significant portion of it. The yep. fact that when we submitted the current year budget, um, that was a decision made long after that. Yep. And trying to fill some of those vacant positions yeah, just trying to connect the dots. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Yep. But, um, <clears throat> looking at your other uh, other operating revenue dropping significantly from three hundred sixty-eight thousand down to fifty-four thousand projected in twenty twenty. Um, is there what is going on there? You said other operating. Yes, I think I've got it right. Um, other operating revenue. Uh, Oh, you were you were looking at the decrease in the amount, other operating rate of revenue total, yes. budgeted of nine thirty five going forward, down from one point two million in two thousand eighteen. Yes. Yes, that was what I was actually just talking about the retail pharmacy loss. Okay. The okay. Pri that's okay. one of the biggest okay. numbers that's in there, and it's. Okay. And so the, the biggest thing I want to talk about is when I visited with you folks down there, um, you talked about um, your other uh, non operating revenue. Um, and most of that and, uh, comes from contributions. So, Correct. And that you had kind of two board structures, one operating the hospital and the other uh, kind of uh, trying to raise money from the community. Yeah. Um, and that that has been struggling a bit just because the economy, real estate uh, uh, um, in the Townsend area is, is not as strong as it once was. And that, um, you know, but, but people who buy property there that are second homeowners just want to know that there's a, a, a good medical facility, hospital uh, near to them. Um, but then uh, the connection uh, you make in your presentation is, um, as discussed, earlier Medicaid is our primary source of cost shift, 1.7 million in fiscal 2018 per the Greenmont Careforce cost shift analysis. Unfortunately, the very generous support of our community the bulk of our non-operating revenue goes toward covering Medicaid's failure to pay adequately rather than toward um, bettering our facility and ability to provide patient care. And I was kind of looking at your growth in charges and your growth in um, uh, contract allowances. Mm -hmm. And for uh, commercial, that's actually a favorable, a favorable relationship. But for Medicaid, it's a highly negative relationship. Right. But, 
uh, as charges go up, the um, uh, contract allowances go down. And I'm, I'm, you know, looking at your bottom line, just just wondering whether the cost shift is an existential threat to Grace Cottage over, over time? It's a concern, certainly. Um, over time, and, and I, our ultimate goal at Grace Cottage is to try and shift business away primarily, I mean honestly, from Medicaid to get more commercial. Um, I kind of believe that that's going to be helped a little in the year going forward. We take pretty much care, we, we probably currently take care of all the Medicaid people that live in our area. Um, we can see that a lot of the additional primary care people that are now traveling more so to come to our area for services, fortunately, are commercial. So hopefully that addition, some of that additional business we're getting is going to be a larger percentage of commercial payers versus Medicaid payers. Um, going, following up on um, the earlier discussion with Matt Scutney, we all know that the population is aging as well, and although Medicare is not a top-notch payer, um, it is certainly considerably better than Medicaid, so every Medicaid patient that becomes a Medicare patient is also helpful to our bottom line. Um, I think that's it. It's a, it's a pretty simple budget to look at, and the moving parts I think you've explained, and uh, um, I, I would uh, hope that you're not as hopeless about uh, addressing the cost shift, which is something I, I think needs to be addressed, and uh, uh, rather than just accepting it as a fait accompli right. that, um, you know, maybe uh, we can all kind of raise our voices a little bit. Um, so those that are vulnerable to it, most vulnerable to it, um, aren't, um, uh, you know, that, that stress is lessened. Right. Maureen. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate your comment saying that your NPR overall is small relative to, you know, all the other hospitals, um, and that maybe that's why you're trying to have us look at, you know, a 12% increase year over year from where your projection was in NPR is, is small dollars. But you've missed your budget the past several years, including this year, even with your revised projection, you're missing your 2019 budget. And one of the areas that's been of great concern is the smaller hospitals that miss their top line budget. Their expenses stay relatively fixed and you continue to lose money and you've lost money year over year. Um, so just trying to really get a handle on your 2020 increase and a couple questions. One, in 2000, 2019 commentary, one of the things you talked about was the pretty large decline in emergency room visits, and that was one of the main reasons why you're missing your numbers this year. And can you talk a little bit about that, what's going on there, and if you think that's going to continue for next year? The, that was one of the questions that was asked by the board. I mean, I, I don't remember talking about the significant, I mean, I answered the question that was asked in that, yes, it's a 10% decline. I don't recall bringing up that one of our reasons for not meeting 2019's projections was based on emergency room revenue. Our biggest reason for not meeting 29 projections was the fact, 2019 projections originally was that we didn't have the primary care providers on staff in the early part of the fiscal year that we had planned on having. I mean, I did answer the question that was asked about ED, a significant decrease in ED volume of almost 10%. Right. But I don't remember using that as justification why we weren't meeting our projections. Okay, it seemed like that was one of the comments. Um, just looking at trying to dissect the 2020 mm -hmm. um, forecast, and I'm looking at uh, kind of your quarterly year over year change. Mm -hmm. um, and in your commentary, you did say that in January, I think you were fully staffed up for the primary care. Correct. 
Correct. So in the first quarter of your year, which would have been obviously October through December, um, year over year, you were down 8.2%. Mm -hmm. In the second quarter, you were up 1.4%. Mm -hmm. In the third quarter, you were down 0.6%. In the fourth quarter, prior to this change, you were up 2.6%. And so to then take that forward, I get the first quarter is an outlier, you were down like 8%. But every other quarter, you've only been up between 1% to 3% over a prior year. And so your new forecast is up 12.3% over your 19 projection. Um, so I'm just having a hard time getting there because you would think some of that trend, if you're fully staffed up now for your primary care, that that would be, we'd be seeing that quarter to quarter. It, the increase, this current year, with that provider started, it was the second week of January. Um, as uh, Joe said earlier, it takes a while for a primary care provider to build up a full practice. So, you know, it's taking through this year to get him fully up and running. Um, you know, knock on wood, you can't control providers coming and going. We've had a lot of flux over the past year. When you look, when we were here last year at this time, we had just had three providers leave, all for varying reasons. One located out of the area to be closer to the family. One didn't want to do primary care anymore. It wasn't that we had people leave to go down the street to work. Um, it makes when primary care is your biggest business much like if we were sitting here as a hospital that did surgeries when you have a surgeon leaves it takes a long time to recover from that primary care is the bulk of our business and when you have even two FTEs leave out of ten that's a big hit um, from what we can see the, the patients coming the patients that are calling looking for service we see that we have the volume needed to have all of the providers that we have both in-house and coming in the month of <coughs> September be full and take care of those patients in the coming year. You're right, I mean, you can't predict that. It could all change. I also can't sit here and say that I can predict that next month I'm gonna have the same number of swing bed patients that I had this month. I mean, I can only use my best guess that I'm gonna continue needing to take care of those patients. No, I understand that. I mean, it's just, you know, our guidance obviously was, you know, three and a half percent. And you've missed your budget year over year um, on the top line for various reasons. And now, you know, to ask for a, such a large increase and you're going to have expenses tying to that, you know, the, the concern is more that we get here next year and you didn't hit that number that you were projecting. You hit, it, hit the expenses and you're losing a lot of money. Right. You know, because your commercial rate is $100,000 is all it contributes. Right. You know, so you, yeah. so you're, you are a hospital that I think has the lowest commercial reimbursement as a percentage of your total than any of the others. I think you're 28% reimbursed commercial. So right. you know, your commercial is not what's making it up. That's not exactly. a big concern. The concern is what we've talked about for many of the hospitals on aspirational budgeting. And you know, we all know what's going on with Springfield, but we challenge them year over year to say, your numbers are too high. You're not gonna hit these numbers. It doesn't make sense. And I'm still not convinced on your numbers here based on your trend this year, based on what you're up year over year, that you're gonna hit a 12% increase. I mean. You know, with, it's almost like it, if they, it is what it is. It's gonna, we're gonna end up here next year, and you either came in with that number or not. But the concern again is that you, you don't hit that, you miss, and you're you're losing a million to two million dollars, and you do have a community that stepped up and helped you support your business. Yes, you're subsidizing with Medicaid, but so is everybody else. I mean, commercial and Medicare, where where that gets made up. So that's not different than the other hospitals. Um, so I just want, you know, I guess was one of the follow-ups would be to really have you guys go back and just bridge the difference between this forecast in 2020, where you're trending right now, and how, how we can feel convinced that that's where you're gonna come in. Again, with the concern being you don't hit the number, 
and you lose a, lose a bit of money. Okay. Um, and I think everything else is answered. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. And, and Steve, I know that uh, Grace is very committed to the mission of meeting all the needs of the population. So um, I didn't take what you were saying in a negative light. I just want you to, to know that I appreciated your documentation of where you are at the beginning to try to get right. back to that uh, margin because if you have no margin, you have no mission. And That's true. You guys certainly have a history of... Uh, you know, starting with Dr. Otis and going right on, on through that. In the 34 years I've worked there, we've never had a margin. Yep. One year I think we had 69,000. <laughs> kind of 34 years, it's not a real good track record. Fortunately, you have some good donors. Yes. <laughs> so, Steve, can you walk me through um, how you came up to your um, request for the, the change in charge? The change in charge or the change in charge the change in charge um, we build the budget based on our best estimate starting with volumes um, we put that together I base the revenue on where I think it will be at the end of next year again um, it's truly a crapshoot I mean figuring out what patients are going to come in um, we look at the <coughs> excuse me expenses necessary to cover that, and as has been pointed out before, particularly in a critical access hospital, the majority of our expenses are fixed expenses. You know, I've got to have a certain number of X-ray techs in the building every day, a certain number of lab techs in the building every day, whether I'm seeing patients or not, um, and then look at some various charge increases to. <coughs> try and cover that bottom line. And the, what we requested was about as low or high, as low an increase as I could go to get close to a positive bottom line. Um, even a 3.2% gross charge increase only adds at best, depending on the service line, a couple of percent to the bottom line. Can you talk about that across the service lines? <clears throat> Um, as Dave pointed out earlier, we have very few payers who actually pay as a percentage. Um, we essentially, in, in truth, it really doesn't matter what we charge in the <coughs> physician practice. Everything in the physician practices are paid either on a fee schedule or costs for the Medicare patients. Um, on the hospital side, because we're a critical access hospital, Truthfully, what we charge doesn't really matter for any of the Medicare patients. It doesn't matter for any of the Medicaid patients because they're all paid on a fee schedule. The, we only have a few commercial payers who pay a percent of charges on whether it be inpatient or outpatient charges. Um, and even those don't pay everything. Blue Cross is a good example. They pay a percent of charges for most inpatient work and for some outpatient work. But for instance, our biggest area of outpatient business is lab and x-ray, and those are all paid on a fee schedule. As long as what we're charging is more than the fee schedule, which is not hard to do since the fee schedule is so low, it doesn't matter what we're charging. So it's really a, you know, there's very, very little area, truthfully, to increase charges and expect to get any money from it. So, you know, as part of the all payer model, there's been a real focus on trying to uh, promote more um, <clears throat> primary care, and that really is central to what your mission is really on primary That's care. That's our primary mission. Yep. So can you just talk to us, um, it might be Doug that might be better off on this one, um, Doug, about how um, you're measuring whether or not the primary care that's being given um, is really the type of primary care that actually does promote uh, prevention and wellness and does save costs to the system. How, how are you measuring, you know, um, for example, um, consultations on pre-diabetic care, things like that, that um, in the long run save the system money, um, but only if they're done right. 
that's a really great question. And um, we, we confront that challenge every single day. And I wish I could give you a really scientific and mathematical answer as to how to measure the impact. Uh, but it's really all about social determinants of, of health. It's, it's, it's more conjecture and le really less science. Um, you know, we, we talk with our, with our medical staff and providers regularly, the medical executive committee and the medical staff meets uh, regularly and they, and they talk about uh, protocols, they talk about the things they're seeing in their practices and their offices, types of, uh, of needs being presented by the community and how they're meeting those needs. Uh, and um, it's really um, the, 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 um, the art of, of, of taking care of patients uh, as designed by the providers every single day in the exam, in the exam rooms, um, with you know face to face with their with their patients, um, but we know that um, we're making a difference because uh, the the types of services we we provide, the types of of patients that um, and, and the the medical challenges that those patients present to our providers are things that. Uh, uh, are treatable. They're uh, they're able to, to 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 tell us whether or not patients who coming who are coming into the into the practice uh, pre diabetic are are actually heeding their advice and and doing the things they need to do to uh, improve their condition. Uh, they can tell us whether or not patients who are coming into the practice with hypertension uh, are. Uh, changing the way they eat, uh, whether they're they're taking their medication, whether they're filling their prescriptions, and coming back and being reassessed and showing improvement uh, in their in their their uh, medical uh, uh, well-being. And so, uh, as, I, as I said, you know, there's not a whole lot of science uh, that can help us um, truly measure the impact, um, but we know from you know, historical uh, studies, and we know from uh, the, the literature that um, having a relationship with a provider, whether it's a physician or an advanced practice provider, um, really does make an impact in uh, improving the health of the patient. And uh, we really pride ourselves on the relationship. Uh, it's really about building relationships. And uh, as long as we continue to see new patients coming to Grace Cottage, new patients um, uh, developing relationships with our providers and coming back routinely uh, for well visits and for care in the office, uh, we, we truly believe and we, we know in our hearts that we're making a difference. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm really rooting for you to, uh, hopefully your negotiations with One Care are successful because you know, so much of everything that we do is rooted in that primary care, and, and I would be really disappointed if there was one black hole in the state that was Grace Cottage. So, now we, we we actually, as Stephen said, you know, we we believe we believe in the ACO, and we believe yeah. that the work they're trying to do is the right work for healthcare in the state of Vermont, and we want to we want to participate, and we also believe that we bring uh, we can bring great value to the ACO, but we can't. We can't go out of business trying. Yeah, we get that. <laughs> so thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocates. Oh. <laughs> I will be quick. I always go last, so I blew it myself. <laughs> uh, okay. um, and I will be quick because I know the healthcare advocate has to go, and we all probably want lunch, so I will try and be fast. Um, I just want to echo some of Maureen's concerns and just suggest that I think some more backup to substantiate the growth from projected to 2020 um, in your physician services. And I think something that might be helpful, it's not clear to me, so you mentioned that you've got these primary care providers that you've onboarded, uh, but you said MD hours were coming down. So the net effect, it would be helpful to understand a little bit more what the pent-up demand was, was there wait times for primary care providers that now you're, you know, meeting some unmet need, what was the percentage of the population in your area that didn't have access to a primary care provider, something like that that would help us understand 
how you're going to get from where you are from 2019 to 2020, simply based on expansion of primary care. So I'll just share that because I have some of the same concerns that Maureen does. Um, uh, a lot of the hospitals that we've been hearing from this year, more than in previous years, have really initiated some cost savings initiatives. And I think largely that's because of the financial situation of many of our hospitals with their uh, operating margins. Grace Cottage, with your history of negative operating margins, um, I'm wondering if you, I didn't see much in the narrative to talk about the specific cost savings initiatives that you're taking on. Um, generally, you talked about you know, trying to look at staffing when there's turnover, but you also said there's very little turnover. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what initiatives you might be seeing in 2020. How can you start to think about bending that cost curve, recognizing you're a small hospital with high credit, I mean, fixed costs. Right. Are you part of a group purchasing agreement that you can leverage even further? I mean, what are other things that you can be doing in the event that, as some of us are concerned, you don't hit that top line in terms of revenue from these new practices, for practitioners, your expenses can be? Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Stephen uh, speak to the, from, from, the, from the financial side of, of that question, but uh, I, I truly believe that, that keeping our costs relatively flat year over year is, is a demonstration of our ability to lower cost uh, because expenses go up every year. And if we can keep our expenses, um, our, our, our increase or our change in expenses below inflation, uh, we are actually I believe making progress, and uh, we are a, we are a very small organization, and as such, there there's there are less um, opportunities for reducing costs. As Stephen says, you know, a lot of our costs are 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 variable, but yet they 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 behave like fixed costs because uh, of the of the lack of the economy of scale in in, in terms of the smaller volume. Uh, we just don't. We don't have the ability to to cut below a certain a certain level of, of, of staffing within the organization. There are some departments that just uh, will never go below where they are today in terms of uh, worked hours. So, uh, but I think that the fact that our, our you know we're able to keep our expenses uh, year over year relatively uh, in check is a demonstration that we, we are making some progress in, in tackling. But there's not a whole lot of low hanging fruit left to Grace Cottage. And, and I agree. When you look at, take, <coughs> excuse me, particularly operating expenses, they have stayed flat or even gone down in the last couple of years. However, we've looked continually. And to answer your first question, we are part of um, group purchasing, particularly the NIA group purchasing program. I was just up there last Friday. There are seven hospitals, including us, who are looking to do a group workers' comp plan, we will be changing workers' comp companies on October 1st, which is a $17,000 savings for us. Um, we look every day, our maintenance director is at desperately trying to reduce utility expenses even further than they have been. He was just talking the other day about wanting to do LED lighting in two more of our buildings, taking advantage of Efficiency Vermont, having a large rebate program right now. Um, we got a new HVAC system last year in our administrative and physician practices offices and he realized that it had the ability to limit when the heat could come on and off and even though the maintenance department reports to me they won't let me have heat at 6 a.m. I have to wait for the heat to come on at 7 so <laughs> be prepared when I get there at 6 that I'm going to be cold. Um, I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, He's not kidding. But you know we, we're, we look every day. We look at Every time we buy something, it's a question of do we really need it? Is there a cheaper place to get it without compromising patient care? Um, we really try to um, reduce costs wherever we can. Keep at it, have at it. <laughs> um, I guess my last question is, rel I'm asking this question of all the hospitals, to just get a sense of relative pricing. So. You've probably heard that I've asked this question, so hopefully you've got the answer for it, <laughs> which is if on average, you know, Medicare reimbursed $100 for a particular service, what on average would your commercial payers reimburse for that same service? Off the top of my head, I would say somewhere around $130 probably. Thank you. Okay, now Eric. <laughs> and again, my apologies, Jess. No worries. Okay. 
Um, just two quick questions, hopefully. Okay. Just two questions. First, I just want to acknowledge that, or congratulate you on onboarding three mental health uh, providers for the health, the licensed clinical social workers, advanced practice RN, and the mental health counselor. Um, so, you, you, you stated that um, the collection agency follows patient-friendly billing policy for practices. Mm -hmm. Um, are there internal mechanisms to check on that? So I ask just because there's a, you guys have a relatively high or solid good collection rate on that debt. And of course, to me, that's like either your collection agency is doing the right thing, or it also makes me concerned maybe they're not, I guess I'm worried about whether they're following the guidelines that they say they are, and how you would know whether what the case is. I am fairly certain in my response here that we have, they do record their calls and we have the ability if we wanted to listen to patient calls that their um, representatives were making to our patients. I'm not sure if we've done that recently. I think we did when they first started. Um, they have predefined scripts they use when they call to, and that's essentially the extent of our collections. It's essentially phone calls to the patients. Um, they don't do anything outside of that, threatening collect, um, you know, legal services or anything like that. And so the second question, the last question, is just that, so if you look over um, your FAP approvals over time, so between 14 and 18, you're hitting an average of around 58, 60%, except, um, in 17, where it drops down to 38%. And then at that same time, between 14 and 18, um, the amount of applications denied for being incomplete is around 28%, I would say, except in 17, where it spikes to 60% denied for being incomplete. And so I was wondering if you could say what happened in 17, and the fact it looks like you've corrected or how, it looks like it's corrected in 18, but why or how? That's a really good question. I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, the person who processed all of our applications actually just left two months ago. and It's actually now being done by our new resource advocate, but I'm not truthfully sure what specifically happened that year. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Eric. At this time, we'll open up to the public for any comments on the Grace Cottage budget. Yes, Dale. Clarification. Are they the ones that had testified in the past that they have a specific population they serve in the summer only? They're vacationers that they serve and therefore they're only there part of the year and come to them for primary care while they're on vacation? No, I don't think we've ever made that. Our population changes a little bit. We ha probably have a lot of people that are only there in the summer. Alternatively, we have a lot of people that are only there in the winter. But our overall population of who we serve doesn't is pretty consistent throughout the whole year. We don't have large swings. OK, is there other public comment? If not, just to, before we break for lunch, I just want to clarify that on the agenda, after we hear from Vaz, um, there is an item for general discussion later today, and that general discussion will include our staff. And um, with that, I think uh, 115 sound reasonable. Okay, we'll uh, we'll resume at 115 with Springfield.